Every year, millions of tons of sugar beets are harvested around the world. Humble root vegetables that transform into one of the most widely used ingredients on Earth. Sugar. From the fertile fields of North America and Europe to high-tech factories running 24-7, sugar production from sugar beets is a marvel of agricultural science and industrial engineering. In this video, we'll take you behind the scenes of how sugar is made, from planting and harvesting sugar beets, to extracting and refining the crystals inside, until it becomes the white granules we sprinkle into our tea or mix into desserts. Did you know that sugar is one of the world's oldest documented commodities? While the first indications of sugarcane's domestication were around 8000 BCE, extracting real sugar from beets is a more recent discovery. The modern sugar beets' roots are buried deep in history, politics, and geography. In 1747, three decades before the American colonies declared their independence, German chemist Andreas Margraff discovered that sugar beet roots contained sucrose, the same sugar as that of sugar cane. Margraff's apprentice, Franz Karl Achard, began selectively breeding sugar beets in 1784. In 1801, he opened the world's first sugar beet factory in what is now Poland. The sugar content of those first factory beets was 6%, compared to modern beets, 15% to 20% sucrose. During the Napoleonic Wars 35 years later, the English blockade of continental Europe cut off cane sugar supplies from the West Indies. This prompted the development of beet sugar's commercial viability. By 1850, the sugar beet industry was well established in Europe. Sugar beets made their way to New England in 1836, but failed to take root. In the middle of the 19th century, an attempt was made to cultivate sugar beets in Utah, but that was not successful either. It wasn't until 1870 that the first successful sugar beet factory was built in the United States in Alvarado, California. It was then that the industry took off. By 1914, the United States rivaled Europe in sugar beet production. Three years later, there were more than 90 sugar beet factories operating in 18 states. As of 2017, there were 20 operating sugar beet factories in nine states, processing 35 million tons of sugar beets, grown on more than 1 million acres. Today, sugar beets are grown in 52 countries. More than 4.5 million tons of sugar are produced each year in the U.S. from sugar beets, which represents more than 54% of domestic sugar production in the U.S. Sugar beets thrive in temperate climates with long daylight hours, such as the northern U.S., Canada, Germany, France, and Ukraine. Fields are plowed and leveled to ensure proper drainage, and GPS-guided tractors plant the seeds in precise rows, about an inch deep and several inches apart. As the beets grow, they begin to store sucrose in their fleshy roots. Within 90 to 120 days, the plant develops a leafy crown above ground, while the beet underground swells, eventually reaching the size of a football and weighing between 2 to 5 pounds. Farmers monitor the plants throughout the season using drone surveillance, soil sensors, and AI-driven irrigation systems. Weeds are controlled mechanically or chemically, and pests are managed using integrated pest control methods. As summer ends and autumn arrives, the beets are ready for harvest. At this point, each root can contain 15 to 20% sucrose by weight. Harvesting sugar beets is a delicate yet powerful process. Specialized beet harvesters move slowly across the fields, cutting off the leafy tops and lifting the beets out of the ground using rotating wheels and cleaning rollers. The beets are then transferred via conveyor belts into large trailers. Within hours of harvesting, they are transported, often in fleets of trucks, to nearby processing facilities, known as sugar beet factories or refineries. During peak harvest season, these factories operate around the clock. A single facility can receive up to 20,000 tons of beets per day. Upon arrival, the beets are weighed, sampled for sugar content, and stored in vast outdoor piles, known as beet clamps, that can stretch for hundreds of meters. These piles are ventilated to keep the beets cool and prevent spoilage.
Before any sugar can be extracted, the beets must be thoroughly cleaned. The first stop inside the factory is the washing station, where beets are tumbled in large rotating drums filled with water to remove soil, rocks, and plant debris. Any foreign materials, such as stones or metal fragments, are separated out. Clean beets then move to the slicing machines, where they are cut into thin, french fry-like strips known as cassettes. This increases the surface area and allows for better extraction of sucrose. These cassettes are then sent into the extraction tower, a massive vertical chamber where hot water circulates countercurrent to the beet slices. Over about an hour, the hot water draws out the sucrose, producing a golden-brown liquid known as raw juice. The leftover beet pulp, still rich in fiber, is pressed, dried, and pelletized to become animal feed, particularly for cattle and horses. Raw juice may contain around 12 to 14 percent sucrose, but it also includes impurities like organic acids, proteins, and minerals. To purify it, the juice undergoes carbonation and filtration. First, lime, calcium hydroxide, and carbon dioxide are added to the juice. The lime reacts with impurities and causes them to form solids, while the CO2 helps precipitate calcium carbonate, which traps unwanted compounds. The mixture is then filtered through massive rotating drum filters, removing the solids and leaving behind thin juice, a clearer, more purified solution. Next, the thin juice is concentrated using multi-stage evaporators, which boil off excess water under vacuum pressure. The result is thick juice, containing about 60 to 70 percent sugar. This syrup is then sent to vacuum pans, where it's boiled again under reduced pressure, causing sugar to crystallize out of the solution. Once the crystals form, the mixture, called massacuite, is sent to centrifuges. These spinning machines separate the sugar crystals from the remaining molasses. The raw sugar is now white, but may still carry a slight yellow tint, due to natural residues. Depending on the factory, it may undergo further refining, including charcoal or ion exchange filtration, to produce pure white sugar. Once separated, the sugar crystals are still moist and warm. They are conveyed into drying drums where warm air removes excess moisture. Then, the sugar is cooled on vibratory cooling belts to avoid clumping. At this stage, the sugar is graded by crystal size, fine, granulated or coarse, and then directed to automated packaging lines. Some sugar is bagged in 1 kg or 5 lb retail packs. Others go into 25 gram sacks or bulk containers for industrial customers. Each package is labeled, sealed, and quality checked using laser sensors, metal detectors, and weight checks to ensure consistency and safety. The sugar beet industry is a model of zero waste processing. Besides sugar, every part of the beet is used. The leafy tops are returned to the soil or composted. Beet pulp becomes livestock feed. The molasses is used for fermentation in ethanol production, yeast cultivation, or even as a feed additive. Waste lime is used as a soil amendment in agriculture. Factory water is recycled through advanced treatment systems. In many cases, sugar beet factories generate their own energy by burning biogas from beet residues. From a tiny seed to a gleaming spoonful of sugar, the journey of beet sugar is one of precision, science, and efficiency. What once grew quietly underground ends up on bakery shelves, coffee tables, and dinner plates around the world. Next time you sweeten your tea or bite into a cookie, remember, it might just come from a sugar beet harvested in a field thousands of miles away. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this behind the scenes journey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more fascinating stories of how everyday things are made. Uh, once the raw sugar gets to the refinery, we go through the affination station or... Every spoonful of sugar begins a long journey, from sun-drenched sugarcane fields to the pure white crystals in your kitchen. This transformation is driven by nature, machinery, and precise chemistry. Today we'll follow the complete process of how sugar is made from cane, from harvesting and juice extraction to refining, crystallization, and packaging. Sugar begins its journey in the fields, where vast rows of tall green stalks sway under the tropical sun. Sugarcane thrives in warm, humid climates and is primarily grown in countries like Brazil, India, Thailand, and parts of the southern United States. Each stalk is essentially a giant grass, 
growing up to 10 feet tall and packed with sweet juice inside its fibrous core. Farmers prepare the land months in advance, planting cane either by seeds or cuttings from mature stalks. With proper irrigation, fertilization, and pest control, the crop slowly matures over the course of 12 to 18 months. By the time the cane is ready for harvest, its juice contains the highest concentration of natural sucrose. But this is just the beginning. When harvest season arrives, speed is essential. Sugarcane must be processed quickly after cutting, ideally within 24 hours, or the natural sugars begin to degrade, reducing both quality and yield. That's where modern mechanical harvesters come in. These massive machines drive through the fields, cutting the stalks at the base, stripping off the leaves, and chopping the cane into short segments known as billets. A single harvester can collect up to 100 tons of cane in a single day. The billets are then loaded onto trucks and transported immediately to the sugar mill. Timing is everything. The closer the field is to the mill, the better the juice quality. Once the cane arrives, the next phase begins, extracting every drop of sugary juice from the freshly cut stalks. At the mill, the freshly cut cane is unloaded onto large conveyor belts that carry it toward a series of heavy-duty crushing mills. These mills use massive steel rollers to press and squeeze the cane, forcing out the juice contained within the fibrous stalks. But it's not a one-step process. The cane passes through multiple crushing stages, each one designed to extract more juice than the last. To improve efficiency, hot water may be sprayed onto the cane between mills, a technique called imbibition, to help wash out the remaining sugars. By the end of this process, over 90% of the juice is extracted. What's left behind is called bagasse, a dry, pulpy material made of cane fiber. But this byproduct isn't wasted. The gas is burned as biofuel to power the mill's boilers, making many sugar factories nearly energy self-sufficient. Meanwhile, the extracted juice, murky, greenish, and full of impurities, is sent on to be purified and clarified. That's where the real transformation begins. The raw sugarcane juice, straight from the crushing mills, is far from sweet and crystal clear. It's a cloudy, greenish liquid filled with bits of fiber, dirt, and organic compounds. If left untreated, it would quickly ferment and spoil. To turn this murky juice into something usable, the first step is heating. The juice is pumped into large tanks and brought to a boil at around 100 degrees cells to 212 reflux. Heating helps to kill off microbes and prepares the juice for chemical treatment. Next, a carefully measured amount of lime, calcium hydroxide, is added to the hot juice. This raises the pH level and causes impurities, such as proteins, waxes, and suspended solids to clump together and settle out. This mixture then flows into massive clarifiers, large settling tanks where gravity does the work. Over time, the solid impurities sink to the bottom, forming a layer of sludge that is removed and sometimes reused as fertilizer. The clearer juice, now amber in color, is skimmed from the top and sent onward for evaporation. While it may still look like syrup, it's now free from the bulk of impurities and ready for the next big step, concentration. Now purified, the sugarcane juice still contains about 85% water. Crystallization is where syrup turns into sugar. It's a carefully controlled process, part science, part precision art. The thick cane syrup is pumped into large vacuum pans, enclosed vessels where boiling occurs under low pressure. This allows the syrup to boil at lower temperatures, reducing the risk of burning the sugar and helping to control the size of the crystals. To begin crystallization, technicians add tiny seed crystals, microscopic grains of sugar that act as nuclei. As the syrup cools and water continues to evaporate, sugar molecules latch onto the seeds, slowly forming larger and larger crystals. This growing mixture of syrup and sugar crystals is known as masicuate, a thick, slushy material that resembles wet sand. Once the crystals reach the desired size and purity, the masicuate is ready for separation. But at this stage, sugar and syrup are still tightly intermixed. That's where centrifugal force comes in. To separate the sugar crystals from the remaining syrup, the masicuit is fed into high-speed centrifuges. These spinning drums act like giant salad spinners, rotating at thousands of revolutions per minute. 
the centrifugal force pushes the heavier sugar crystals outward, while the sticky syrup, known as molasses, is flung through fine perforations and drained away. The result? Golden brown raw sugar, still moist, slightly sticky, and covered in a thin film of molasses. At this stage, the sugar is usable for some industrial and food applications, but it's not yet the pure white sugar most people recognize. The separated molasses doesn't go to waste. It's a valuable byproduct used in the production of ethanol, animal feed, and even baked goods like gingerbread and brown bread. But for table sugar, the clean, bright crystals used in your coffee and kitchen, one more journey remains. That journey continues in the refining stage. To transform raw sugar into the pure white crystals we know, it must go through a precise refining process. First, the raw sugar is melted down into a syrup once again. This step allows any remaining molasses, color compounds, and microscopic impurities to be removed more effectively. The syrup is then passed through clarification filters, such as activated carbon or ion exchange resins, which remove color and trace minerals. This step strips away the brown tint and brings the solution closer to colorless purity. After filtration, the purified syrup returns to a vacuum pan, where the crystallization process is repeated, but under even more controlled conditions. New seed crystals are introduced, and as the syrup cools, pure white sugar crystals begin to form. This second round of crystallization produces sugar that is over 99.9% .9 sucrose, food grade, and ready for human consumption. The white massacuit is then centrifuged once again, separating the refined crystals from any remaining syrup. These crystals are washed, spun, and prepared for final drying. Freshly spun refined sugar still retains a small amount of moisture. To ensure stability and shelf life, the crystals are sent through hot air dryers, reducing moisture content to below 0.05%. Next, the dry sugar passes through vibrating screens, which separate it by size, fine, granulated, or coarse. Each grade has specific uses, from baking to beverages to industrial food processing. Oversized or undersized crystals are melted and recycled back into the refining process, minimizing waste. Once graded, the sugar moves to automated packaging lines. Depending on the destination, it's packed into retail bags, bulk sacks, or industrial containers. Robotic arms seal and stack each package efficiently for shipping. But before any product leaves the facility, it undergoes strict quality control tests, checking for purity, crystal size, color, and microbial safety. From field to factory, every grain of sugar is tracked and tested to ensure it meets international food standards. The result? Perfectly consistent sweetness, ready for kitchens, cafes, and food factories around the world. If you enjoyed this behind-the-scenes look at how cane sugar is made, and want more in-depth journeys into the world of food, manufacturing, and technology, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so you never miss a new episode. We've got more fascinating processes coming your way. One grain, one drop, and one invention at a time. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.